And as we're pretty much rightly dividing from 2 Timothy 2.15, we're rightly dividing the word of truth. We're looking into Mark chapter 16. A lot of Christian circles go to this. We have our outline that uh, you can see either from the YouTube channel or from the uh, handout that will be sent to everybody. Uh, just going to our introduction is that you know, a lot of Christian circles today, primarily Pentecostals, go into Mark chapter 16. They go there just to see what, you know, what should we be doing? What's our commission? What is God commissioning us to do today? So they go into Mark chapter 16, thinking that's where we need to go to find our marching orders today. And even when they read it and they say, well, this doesn't look quite right, they don't know what to do with it. You know, who, you know, where does this plug in to what we're supposed to do today? Where, how do I make this fit? And when they even get challenged, we'll look at that today. When somebody challenges them on these verses, you know, how, do I, how do I plug this in? How does this work? If all I have is the red letters for my uh, ammo to respond with, to answer with, and, and if all you're using is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, how am I going to respond to such information that I find in Mark chapter 16? So this is where we're going to go with this, is we're going to look at the Mark chapter 16. And of course, we see that there in uh, verse 15 is our start. And pretty much what we're looking at is that uh, they, they grab on these Christian circles, red letter Christians, grab on to Mark chapter 16. They kind of correlate it with Matthew chapter 18, line it up with John chapter 20 even. And they call it their great commission. You know, our great, they would say, you and I have this great commission that we find here in these verses. And we find that there, they call it the Great Commission Doctrine. And it would, it would fit, you know, be fitting for, not for us, but for what the audience that we read here in these chapters. And so we see that there, that they would need to adhere in a poll. That's what they would think, you know, but is that what we're to do? These instructions and are the signs going to follow us according to what we read, especially in Mark chapter 16? And is it applicable? Can we go ahead and do this? Are these things we could actually go ahead and do? Because after all, we want to go ahead and believe our Bibles literally, and therefore, as we read it, should it do what it says it should do? Uh, otherwise, are we uh, disbelieving God? You know, that kind of thing. So we see that there. So this may be something that we want to delica delicately go over with our red-letter Christian friends in those Christian circles, if that's what they're doing, especially the Pentecostals uh, from those different denominations. Uh, we're going to notice off the bat that this Great Commission doesn't say one word as we read Mark 16, 15 through 18. Uh, oh, we'll read that now. We'll read that and I'll get into the second part here. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 starts out reading. It says, And he said unto them, Go ye into, or go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Uh, they shall uh, take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. If they lay hands on the sick, they, and sorry, uh, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And, and uh, so then uh, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So you read those, and read this here, and then if we didn't know better, if we didn't rightly divide the word of truth, we would say, uh, well, this must be us. This is something we should probably go ahead and do. After all, this is the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. We want to believe God. We want to do what God says. And we would read that and say, hey, I guess I got to do this. And the signs need to follow me. If I'm really a true believer, otherwise I must be a false believer. I don't have enough faith or whatever it may be. But we see here, going back to the intro on our outline, this great commission that we read here in Mark 16, leading into Matthew 28, leading into John 20, it doesn't have one word about the preaching of the cross that you read about in Paul. Uh, it doesn't also talk about the gospel of the grace of God that you read about in Paul. Uh, the gospel, which they were sent to preach in Mark 16, was very evidently uh, not the same gospel uh, that you read about in Paul. It's the same one they've been preaching since Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 is going to match Matthew chapter 28, and it's going to match up with Mark chapter 16. It's going to match up with John chapter 20. And therefore, our red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're going to match up on purpose. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom uh, is what it's going to be called. Uh, only now, only they now could uh, declare, as Peter did at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that the king had risen from the dead, 
and that they would still uh, someday occupy Israel, uh, you know, the throne of the world, even through the throne of David. And so this is what we're reading about. This is what the gospel is, the gospel of the kingdom. And the audience is going to be Israel that we're reading here in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. So we'll break it down and we'll look at the first two verses that we uh, just started to see. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. It goes on and starts out saying, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, and rightly so. We're seeing this is towards the end of the book of Mark. And so he's saying, first of all, he says, And he, that's of course the God, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, said unto them. Now, the them is that the church, the body of Christ. It's, we don't see the body of Christ in one word, one page, one verse, one chapter in the book of Mark. Neither do we see the body of Christ in the book of Matthew. We don't find the body of Christ in the book of Luke, and we don't find the body of Christ in the book of John. It's not there yet. It doesn't start until you see Paul show up. So we're not going to find the body of Christ. We're going to find Israel. We're going to find Jews. We're going to find Israel. We're going to find Hebrews here. And this is why we see this in verse 15. He said unto them, Israel, go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel, that's the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the grace of God, to every creature. Paul says something different in Colossians about how he already went out and preached the gospel to every creature in his day and time. And I believe it's in Colossians chapter 1. I believe it's verse 20 or 21. It talks about that Paul already goes out and preaches the gospel of the grace of God. Does so, and as a result of people not believing over the course of time, it's still up to us to do the same today. Yet, they're commissioned to go do this preach this gospel, this good news, that the kingdom's coming. And you hear that all the way back in Matthew chapter 3. It says in verse 16, as a result, that uh, we see there, it says that uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we see a little bit about that there. But it's about that gospel of the kingdom that's being taught. That gospel of the kingdom, that gospel is what's being presented. If we look at Luke chapter 1, verse 69, so we see a little bit about Mark. Now we're going to see a little bit about Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 69. It goes on to read like this. And it says that, uh, talking about the horn of salvation, this is going to be for Israel in their kingdom, that their Messiah would be born unto them. It says there, um, one verse above it, 60 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Israel, not the body of Christ. For he hath visited and redeemed his people, again Israel, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us, Israel, and the house of his servant David. King David was the king of Israel. So this would all fit and make sense. As he, as he spake by the mouth of all of his holy prophets, which, hath, or which have been since the world began. So we see this mentioned in Luke chapter 1, verse 68 through 70, talking about this is all about the kingdom come, that a Messiah would be there, a Redeemer would be there to redeem those from their sins, which would be Israel. And so he would come and he would have a kingdom in which he would do this way. So we're seeing this being set up here as far as the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. This would be good news for them. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. We saw a little bit from Mark. Now we're seeing a little bit from Luke. Now if we look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, this should sound familiar. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 is something that religious people say every week, and they don't even know why they're saying it. But as we're lining it up with Mark chapter 16 and Luke chapter 1, we're going into Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, and we're seeing that Israel, the little flock of Israel, believing Israel, is to pray for this kingdom that's to come with the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom that's supposed to be coming to them. And he says, and you see that kingdom in Revelation 21, I believe it is, Revelation 22, he says, uh, thy kingdom come, they want it to come, so Lord, your kingdom come to us, for Israel, thy will, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then they pray for manna in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Well, they'll pray for that as they go through the tribulation. But you see that in verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And this is going to be the purpose and the, how it's going to play out in the uh, earthly kingdom. So we see that there. And that's going to be the point of the gospel of the kingdom. That's great news if you're going into that kingdom. 
and that they can go and do it, but they need to repent and be water baptized and do a you know, series of work-oriented performances in order to get into this kingdom. So we see that there, and it's promised to Israel. And of course, it does require works. That's why we see so much about it. If we continue in Matthew, go to Matthew 24, verse 13. In order for Jews to get into these things, to get into the kingdom, Matthew 24, verse 13. We see there is some work that they have to do in order to get into this kingdom. So and that's going to be good news for them. Because the whole world's going to be turned over and flipped, turned upside down, so to speak. And you'll see in Matthew 24, verse 13, it says, uh, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So they're going to have to endure until the end. People think that that's something they have to do today. They'll run into Matthew 24 say, that's my future. It's not your future. It's Israel's future in the kingdom where they preach the gospel of the kingdom going into it or setting up for it. And we see there in verse uh, 24, verse 13, that he that shall endure until the end, until the end of the tribulation, the same shall be saved when Christ comes in Revelation 19, 11. He comes and makes war, makes judgment, and does everything else and you know, brings his servants into the kingdom, Israel. So we see that there. And so this plays a part here in Matthew 24, verse 13. We also look at Matthew 25, verse 32. He was going to say uh, about some works-oriented performances that they'll need to do or they'll be judged by based on the things that they did. Uh, we have the opposite. We're, we operate by faith, not by works. We see there in Matthew 25, verse 32, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats are on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. There's a work. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. You're being judged for a good work. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye gave me, or, I'm sorry, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Uh, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when, when saw we in hunger and fed thee, or thirsty and gave you drink? And so you're seeing this as work-oriented uh, idea of salvation, where they go and do righteous things, and they get judged according to it as they endure unto the end, and they go to the kingdom uh, accordingly. So we're seeing these works-oriented things, and then the opposite takes place, uh, where you see this in uh, verse 40. Of Matthew 25, and the king answered and said unto the verily I sent to you, and as much as ye have done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, these my brethren, the little flock of Israel, ye have done it unto me. And then of course you got the guys on the left hand who don't do enough, or they do wicked works or works that don't benefit Israel. According to Genesis 12, 1 through 3, uh, that would be the little flock of Israel. And we see there depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And so we see a set of works that have to do with you know, wicked works versus righteous works. And it goes into verse 42, 43, 44, and uh, 45, and 46. And so I'll leave that for you to see that. But you see the difference between the two and how it's all about works, which would then lead you into James chapter 2, faith plus works, based on everything you're seeing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if we bring that back into Mark, We'll go back to Mark chapter 16, and we're seeing where all this is kind of plugging into, because we're rightly dividing Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 16. We're going back to Mark chapter 16 and verse uh, 15, and we're seeing there it says that he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature, son, that's what they should write, and be so doing. We're seeing that this is what they're doing, and some of the reasons as to why, what's coming why they would be doing this in the first place, and what's the point and purpose, and how that's not us. It's Jews going into a tribulation who will afterwards be going into a kingdom based on their righteous standing of works. So we're seeing that there in verse 15. We're seeing the context. We're setting it up. We're seeing who it actually belongs to versus who it doesn't belong to. So we're setting it up in verse 15. You see that there. But even as we plug it in even more so, uh, we see quite a bit that uh, says uh, unto every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not uh, shall be damned. And so we see that there. It's all about that works performance. And you even see a distinction in here that there's the, there's the part of the law. Not always talked about water baptism, but those uh, ceremonial washings, you know, priestly washings. You see all about this before. 
but it's talking more so about a distinction between those uh, ceremonial washings for, for Jews uh, to the point where they're going to be carrying what's needed in order to help all the world get into this kingdom at this point in time. And so when we see this, they're talking about the idea of being, he that believeth and is baptized. Now, a lot of people, a lot of Christian circles, take the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 16, and they'll say, well, it says the word saved right there. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. How are you going to get out of this one? How are you going to work yourself? And they'll use that phrase, how are you going to get out of this one? How are you going to explain yourself out of this one? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The words are right there. The words are literally Jesus' red letters right there. That's Jesus talking right there. Said, yeah, he's not talking to us. I, mean, I can find you words where God's talking to Noah. He's not talking to us. He's talking to Noah about being saved from a flood by building an ark. Now, these, uh, these Jews here, the little flock of Israel, will be saved. Anybody can be saved from a tribulational you know, setting tribulational issues and, and uh, events by not only enduring to the end, but he that believeth in the doctrines that are being taught by Christ, and then are water baptized, uh, will be saved according so, because all, all priests of Israel get water baptized. If you look at Leviticus chapter 8, verse 6, we'll see an example from Leviticus chapter 8, verse 6. I always keep this verse close at hand whenever we talk about the issue of water baptism. So it's an important one to have in mind. And it talks about Moses and Aaron. Those are priests of Israel. But the important thing is what's happening here. And we see there it talks about in uh, verse 6, Leviticus 8, 6. And Moses, I'm sorry, and Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Uh, he did that on purpose because that's what the law required them to do, that they would be uh, not only water baptized, but they would be associated with water uh, for cleansing, uh, ceremonial or uh, religious rituals and, and water cleansing uh, as a point for these priests. And we know that all of Israel is to be a priestly nation uh, towards the world at large during this time of the kingdom. So this is where this all plugs into. We even see this more in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. If you look at that, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. I see a lot going on there. And it comes up quite a bit here as well. But this is the key verse where you, where you want to see the distinction that comes up. And when we see about how it's going to be Israel that carries the issues of the law, it's going to be written in their hearts according to their New Testament. Not We, we don't have the New Testament. Uh, they're also going to carry about the issues of water baptism. They're going to be carrying a lot of the issues that are going to help people be saved from all the issues, the tribulational issues going on with the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast and everything else. We see there in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, that it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days uh, it shall come, in those future days that uh, God is telling uh, Zechariah about, uh, to pass, that the ten men shall take hold out of uh, all languages of the nations, even uh, shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So there's going to be the people in the future are going to see uh, a Jew, a Hebrew. And ten men are going to just rush up to him, not to hurt him, not to do anything wrong to him, because they know that Genesis 12, 1 to 3 uh, covenant is in effect, and when prophecy kicks in again. And they're going to grab on hold of him. I guess the garment that they'll wear is that some, something concept of uh, religious you know, garment, ephod, skirt, whatever it may be, they're going to grab on to them. They're going to want to hang on to them and say, we know that, uh, that you're a Jew, uh, for we have heard that God is with you, you know, in, in the kingdom and everything else. And they're going to want to hang on to them and learn everything they can from them. And so the concept of, because they're going to know that he's a priest of God. And so, you know, they he carries with them water baptism, the, the, the notion of doing so, the uh, New Testament, uh, the law is written in their hearts, and that everything else that has to do with God is with that individual. 
And so as we see that there, we bring it back to where we are in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. The whole point of this is that this is a ceremonial cleansing under the law of prophecy. We saw a little bit from Leviticus uh, chapter 8, verse 6. Some other uh, key points, I'll, I'll just leave it for a good cross-reference I have on the outline, is also Exodus 29, verse 4, as well as Numbers chapter 8, verse 7. I've got this here in the outline that you can cross-refer this with. When it comes to the idea of he that believeth and is baptized, of course, we know that in the body of Christ we're baptized as well without one drop of water. It has nothing to do with water. We're identified. Uh, we're immersed for the sake of identification. Uh, the best definition of baptism we'll get is being immersed for the sake of identification. But we know that you can be immersed in the position of Christ. You can be immersed into Christ. You can be immersed into water. You can be immersed into uh, baptism for the dead. You can be immersed or identified with a lot of different things. Water doesn't have to always be the case. And so we're seeing here it is the case in Mark chapter 16. And he that believeth and is baptized uh, shall be saved from the tribulation as a result. And so it says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And they'll be damned to go through the events of the tribulation and deal with the Antichrist, Mark of the Beast, and everything else that comes up as a result of their lack of faith. And they'll be there to deal with everything. And some of the things that happen, we, uh, we kind of plug into as we go forth uh, with this. But it goes forth as well. And we see it also come up a little bit in Matthew 28, because we're seeing that Matthew 28 is also a key chapter that works with Mark chapter 16. So if you go to Matthew chapter 28, we'll look at verse 18. It's another great commission, you know, prophetic uh, type of verse, type of chapter for Israel. But uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, we were just looking a moment ago about the idea of it being, you know, water baptism, that type of thing. And so we were reading about that, uh, you know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now when we get to Matthew 28, verse 18, it says that Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, again, baptizing, baptizing them, you know, water baptizing, uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So again, you see more about this great commission, how these work together. Matthew chapter 28 with Mark chapter 16, where we're kind of rightly divided. We're looking at this today on purpose. If we go back and look at Matthew chapter 18, I'm sorry, 28, Matthew 28, verse 18. Uh, we're breaking this down real quick as we work our way back into Mark 16, because we're still looking at Great Commission information for Israel as to explain where we are and why we're there. It says there that uh, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And the first instinct so a lot of people have coming out of different religious circles is when Jesus says all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth you first start to read that and you think that uh, whoa that must be that lesser Jehovah Witness type of God that uh, you know oh he's given all power like he didn't have it before like he needed to get it from somewhere and God just had to say oh you know, tap Jesus on the shoulder and say oh by the way I got some more power for you because you didn't have it previously and of course, that's the wrong thought. We all, you know, we, we all clearly know that. Uh, but then when you read that verse, that kind of pops out like, well, what is, what's that talking about? When you first read that, but you know, it goes back to the idea of uh, you know, Jesus not developing his omniscience or anything. There's no, no reason to think that. It goes back to the idea. If we look at John chapter 15, verse 16. Goes back to what we had studied months ago, and we always bring this up from time to time just to make sure we're plugging in uh, good information. And that's Mark chapter 15, verse 26. John, hmm? did you say I'm sorry, John, John chapter 15, verse 26. John 15, verse 26. And we're looking at this uh, when it comes to the idea of again, we brought this up for the economic trinity. The ontological trinity, where these three work in unison as God. They have different purposes, and yet they're all God, and they all work together, and they all are, the three are one. That's also 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. But we see in John chapter uh, 15, verse 26, as the example, uh, the three being one and working together, uh, having different purposes, yet all three being God. All three are God, having different purposes. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. 
So we read that quick and we don't glance over. We've done this before, but again, just to kind of break this down even more, you're seeing, but when the Comforter, the God the Holy Spirit, is come, whom I, God the Son, will send unto you from God the Father, even the Spirit of truth, God the Holy Spirit, which proceedeth from God the Father, he, God the Holy Spirit, shall testify of me, God the Son. So you're seeing the Trinity operating in a multitude here. And that's there on purpose. That's to show you that these three are one. These three know what the others are doing. And I say others, but these three are one. These three are God. These three are omniscient. These three are omnipresent. These three are the God that we worship, the God of the Bible. And that's the ontological trinity. That's the economic trinity. That's what we read here, just as the example in John chapter 15, verse 26, which means as we plug it back in to what we're seeing there in Matthew 28, when you read that back in to Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. It was always, it was always his. He's God, the Father's God, the Spirit's God. Uh, as it's, it's, it may be uh, you know, given to him, so to speak, uh, he's essentially saying that you know, some things were not, uh, I'm trying to say this the right way, but there's responsibilities in the Godhead. And as God the Father gives responsibilities to God the Son or gives certain you know, power. It's always God's. And God is God is God is God. And yet we see there's some things uh, Jesus was not uh, authorized by God to give, yet he's God himself. And that's one of a, you know, I say tongue twister to work out, but he's always God. He always will be God. And uh, yet there's different responsibilities. You see in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, the times and the seasons God the Father sets up. Uh, God the Son uh, is the Redeemer, and God the Spirit you know, seals seals us as the example. Different uh, administration, different duties, but they're all God. And so when you see that there in verse 18, it's, it's knowing that he's omniscient and omnipresent the whole time. And so as we move on, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Again, going back to that water baptism, Leviticus chapter 8, verse 6, Israel, under the law and prophecy, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And of course, not the all things, but what would be the all things? Would it be about the cross and being saved by grace through faith and all spiritual blessings like you read about in Ephesians and being saved from your sins like you can read about in Colossians? The answer would be no, these books aren't even there in Matthew chapter 28. Paul's not there. You don't find Paul the Apostle. You don't find glory in the cross there. So the all things in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 28 is going to be about Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7, the parables of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, what you read about about the future in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, which work out to be a good cross reference for the book of Revelation. And it just plugs into everything that whatsoever he commanded them in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which sets up in our understanding where Matthew 5, 6, and 7 go. So we see that there, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So when we see that there from Matthew 28, and we bring it back to Mark 16, where we are, as we rightly divide Mark 16, we're seeing there when it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. We're seeing where the context should be fitting in more and more now. As we look at these verses and we see who's speaking and to whom God is speaking to based on these different doctrines of the ontological trinity, the economic trinity, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing Israel from the body of Christ, rightly dividing prophecy from mystery. We're seeing how this all fits in for rightly dividing Mark chapter 16. How we're seeing a lot of Pentecostals as they run to these chapters. It's a very wrong thing to do to the point where it can be even very deadly. It can literally kill you. And uh, we're going to see why as we continue to go forward. So if we look at, let's see, let's find some other parts where we're at. In uh, part three of our outline, this is where we're moving into now, is verse 17. Verse 17 of Mark chapter 16, verse 17 we looked at the idea of water baptism and it leads into Acts chapter 2 for Israel. The birthday of the church is not where we find our church in Acts 2. But uh, we see there it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. 
In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Uh, and then we'll just read verse 18, and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and shall recover, and they shall recover. Now we see there that there's supposed to be, for them, signs that shall follow them that believe. The question we should ask when we read verse 17 is why? Why were there going to be signs that follow? And of course, for prophecy, signs were meant for the Jew. But when is also the question we need to ask. When, when do these signs kick in? And that would be during the events of the tribulation. During the events of the tribulation, you have earthquakes, you have rebellious angels, you have famines, you have wars, you have antichrist, you have um, everything happening all at one time, um, just destroying you have diseases and plagues and, and everything happening to the point where it's just, it, earth is, is in total chaos nonstop. And it says that uh, these signs shall follow them that believe. It says, in my name shall they cast out devils. And so we see that just to start out there, well, the devil has angels to do his work. And uh, we know that uh, our weapon today is discernment against these uh, doctrines, these you know, so-called doctrines of devils. You know, they Most likely what God is doing today, the devil's going to counterfeit that. And so we can see that even in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, I'll leave that out as a cross-reference, that there are doctrines of devils, most likely setting up religions or things that would counterfeit glorifying the God of the Bible. See that there. But we also had looked earlier at Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, seeing that hell was made for the devil and his angels. And so it would be his angels that would go in there as well, would be the devils. And so we see that take place there. And uh, so the, in, in his name are Israel, the little flock of Israel, are going to cast out devils. And so we even read about that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you remember those verses, where they go forth and they, they rejoice that the devils are cast out there at their command. And so it also talks about in verse 17 that they shall speak with new tongues. If we look at Acts chapter 2, again, a big verse for Israel, where as you read Acts chapter 2, go to verse 4, all you see in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 4, is the information pertaining to Israel. If we go through Acts chapter 2 and we go to verse 4, you're trying to find where it says the body of Christ in this chapter, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find the Apostle Paul. You're not going to find saved by grace through faith and faith alone. It's not here. It's not going to be here. It doesn't happen for seven more chapters until Saul of Tarsus gets saved by God for doing nothing. So we see this here in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the idea of what's happening in Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse uh, 17, they shall speak with new tongues. That comes into Acts chapter 2. Verse 4 goes on to read, uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And uh, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, uh, when this was uh, noised abroad, the multitude came to, uh, together and were confounded because th th every man had heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which spake our lands? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and the Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia uh, and Pontus and, uh, and uh, Asia. And it goes on from there, they're hearing in their own language. So tongues are a language. It's not just babbling incoherently or babbling miscellaneously. It's actual languages that people know and can respond to when they hear it knowing that it's their native tongue or tongue of a certain area that would make sense. So we see this. This is a gift that you see about in Mark chapter 16, verse uh, 17. And it's going to be based on the fact that they go forth and preach the gospel uh, uh, into all the world, the gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom is coming for all the world. And so they can go forth and go into all the world, preaching the languages and speaking with new tongues as they do so, cast out devils as they do so, and whoever believes and as a result gets water baptized, you see in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that when the apostle Peter goes forth and says to the crowd, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, that's Mark 16 and uh, Matthew 28, that he would tell them what Jesus told them to do. So Luke, I'm sorry, Acts uh, 2.38 works off of uh, Mark 16 and Matthew 28, which works off of Previously, Matthew chapter 3.
So we see this all plays out for a reason. This all works itself out in prophecy. And this is where this goes with everything. But then we get into something even more interesting. See if I can find this last couple of verses here. Uh, no, I'll just leave that verse there. I'll save this for another one. Going into verse 18, Mark chapter 16, verse 18. Here's where we're going to get into our first video for the day. And what it's going to show here says, uh, and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink uh, any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Uh, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So what we're seeing here is based on what we're looking at, based on what happens in the tribulation, is that they shall take up serpents. And, and uh, that's the first part, So they shall take up serpents. Now, why would they take up serpents? What would the snakes have to do with any of this? If we look at some of the verses, uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 17, we'll start there. We'll start out in a different tribulational period, we'll call it. And of course, this isn't ours. But in Jeremiah 8, verse 17, there was a different time where Israel was going through a tribulational setting or a trial, I'll call it that, at the very least, uh, of the uh, Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah 8, verse 17. And he tells them. Because of their stubbornness, because of Israel's lack of uh, supporting the one and true and only God of Israel. He tells them, for behold, I will send serpents. There we go there. Cockatrice among you, which shall not be, or which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. When I would uh, comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. And so it goes on there. You see, the idea of this is that the Lord's going to use certain you know, animals or, or life, as you would call it, against Israel, especially when it comes to this, this, uh, you know, these deceitful people, or so on and so forth. And and it's just going to be something that works itself out where. God has this as a part of his covenant. God has this as a part with when Israel, when you break my covenant, then here's what's going to happen. Not curses, I'm sorry, blessings are not going to happen as a result of you breaking my covenant, but curses. And he says that in Jeremiah 8, uh, 17, that uh, I will send co uh, uh, cockatrices and uh, more so serpents. So this is going to be something that kicks in, you know, not only during Babylonian captivity, but he more so sends the nation against them. Uh, but you see it kick in again in the tribulation, but this time the little flock of Israel who are doing that which is right are ready to stomp on these scorpions. They're not going to be bit by them. So we see that there. If you look also in the book of Amos, which is going to be a good cross-reference to how horrific the events are going to be. Amos chapter 5, verse 19. And so get there. The book of Amos chapter 5 and verse 19 is an excellent uh, Good cross reference. And what we'll see here, actually, we'll go to Amos 5 18, one verse up. Amos 5 18. Because what this does is this pictures how horrific the tribulation period is going to be, how horrific the day of the Lord is going to be for those who have to go through it. Now, the remnant will go through it, but they're going to be protected by God. They're going to be fed manna. They're going to be given water. They're going to be given protection. They're going to be given things that where they can make it through, as long as they endure until the end willingly and do that which is right by God. We see there in Amos chapter 5, verse 18. We'll read up there and work our way down. It says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. It says, As if a man did flee from a lion... And a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned on, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. So they're saying it's so bad during that time, during this time of what you read about in the book of Revelation, which is Daniel's 70th week, which is the day of the Lord, which is everything you're reading about. It's so bad, so horrific. You can't escape anything. It says that if you flee from a lion, you run into a bear. So you're running as fast as you can from this lion trying to catch you, only for a bear to come out and kill you instead. Or you uh, run into your house and you lean your hand up against the wall thinking you're safe. And that's when the serpents get you. That's how horrific uh, and how unsafe you are. You, but these people. Uh, 
during the day of the Lord, during Daniel's 70th week. And you see again the idea of serpents biting. And so you see that also in Amos chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, with Jeremiah 8, verse 17. If you look at Amos chapter 9, Amos chapter 9, verse 3, also mentions a little bit of the serpent as well. It says that, and though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, hence, or thence, I will command the serpent, and he shall bite them. So he's saying, I'm going to be using these these animals, these these uh, you know, life forms. Uh, life itself will be against you. The creature will be against you in the day of the tribulation. If you know if you're against me, and I'm, I'm going to send in this chart into the chat room that I have had before. Uh, it shows from and here it is here. Took the picture out a bit of a slant, but uh, should be popping in in just a second. What this is is it's from Leviticus chapter 26, and what is it? It's the uh, judgments. You have judgment one, judgment uh, two, judgment three, judgment four, and judgment five. And what it talks about is you see in Leviticus chapter 26, 13, all the way through 31, that there are actually five judgments that will happen to Israel, and if they fall from this this much of Israel's covenant, then they're going to have judgment one occur. Then if they continue to fall further away, judgment two occurs. And they continue to fall, judgment three occurs. They continue to fall even further, judgment four occurs. And they continue to fall to the end, then judgment five occurs. And you see, it's, it's, it's a slanted picture. I'll try to get a better one for you eventually. But you see, all the way from Judges and Saul to David and Solomon to Elisha, Elisha, and all the way up until Malachi, these five judgments take place with a fallen and stubborn and rebellious Israel that refuses to look back unto God. And so we see that this is something that takes place in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus explains it all the way from uh, chapter 26, verse 11, all the way into, I believe it's uh, verse 30. I'm trying to see my own, uh, I'm sorry, 39. And so what we see there primarily, so I'm trying to see the uh, picture itself, is they have things happen where uh, they get judged on Israel's uh, health. God judges their health. God judges their borders. Uh, God judges their, their climate. God judges, uh, it's interesting, Leviticus 26, 21, and 22 is the judgment of wild beasts. And you can read about historical facts and historical accounts of children crying out against uh, Elisha and saying, you know, oh, you, you have, you have, uh, you're, you're, you're a bald head. And they laugh at him. And as soon as they say that against God's man on the scene, bears come out and, uh, and maul them to death. And so God uses creation against a stubborn and rebellious Israel. And so we see that point. That's the point of why we're seeing animals are against God's people as part of the covenant. The more they fall away from God, the bigger the cursings get to the point where you read at the end that they get taken away by another nation. This nation will be taken away by another nation. That's part of what we're seeing. So this is what we're seeing in Mark chapter 16. When it comes to the idea, we bring it back to where we are. About they shall take up serpents. They'll take up the serpents. They're not going to be attacked by the serpents. They can actually take them up and go forth and operate in spite of the serpents. The little flock of Israel... Believing Israel, faithful Israel, will be able to operate during the time where the world is just falling apart. And they'll be able to take up these serpents. They're not going to have to worry about them. Now, what happens and what goes wrong, horribly wrong, is when people read this today, Mark chapter 16, verse 18, and say, well, I have so much faith in God's word that I can take up a serpent today. That I can do this. And if we want to see something that's going to make our uh, skin crawl pretty much, and we'll go ahead and look at three minutes and 16 seconds of that. We'll see a video right now as I share my screen of a little country church. You know, here this country music playing. And they're going to pick up some serpents. And it's, okay. it's a news article. It's a three minute, and I'll go to there right now, three minute and 16 second uh, article of, uh, sure enough, a, a religious denomination of some type. And they will flat out pick up snakes based on Mark 16, uh, 18. Let me type in the uh, article here. They take up 
service. There it is. Let me run it for about three minutes and 16 seconds and uh, hope you can hope you can watch it. Now we are going to show you people holding snakes. If you're afraid of snakes, you may not want to watch this. Kevin Roberts begins his series of reports taking us into the remote hills of West Virginia to meet the worshippers who take up serpents. It's a hot Saturday night in Jolo, West Virginia. About the only work down here is in the coal mines, and the little towns like Jolo coil up around the mines like a rattler on the rocks. There are scores of such towns back in the hollows, some bigger, some smaller, some not much more than family enclaves. There's not much work, there's not much money, and there's not much to do. So, just as it was when the pioneers first settled here, much of what society there is, is built around the church. And our story is about this church, the Church of the Lord Jesus. The congregation meets every Saturday night and Sunday. And the rockabilly music born in the southern hills, which rumbles from the church in place of hymns, is just your first clue that the service inside is at least directed by God to take up the servant. Her name is Lydia Elkins West. It's just all Her grandmother is matriarch and founder of the Jolo Church. Her mother died there. Her teenage daughter has been raised in the faith, the faith that could take her life. A Christian saint that takes the words of the Bible literally. We're just people trying to go through this world like everyone else and trying to make it to heaven. <laughs> In Jolo, West Virginia, Kevin Roberts, TV2 Eyewitness News. Right, so that's, that's scary. Yeah, it is. Wait, how do I get rid of this? But yeah, that's, uh, let me close this and stop sharing the screen. We're back to where we are. So that's uh, the first part. When you don't rightly divide and when you take everything incorrectly, that is going to be something that uh, I'll leave this open for a thought for a minute while we take a little break. But that's uh, when you don't rightly divide and you run to the red letters to do what Jesus said and you don't understand the audience, you don't understand the instructions, you don't understand what's going on, you could literally get killed for doing the wrong instructions for the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time, thinking you're doing God's work. And that's absolutely scary. But yet, this is something that comes up. And as we see, this is something that people do. Absolutely scary. For failure to rightly divide, for failure to go into Paul. The further away you get from Paul, the further scarier it can get. Uh, at least as far as our understanding goes. Uh, so we see that there. That's uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 18, but that's only some of it. About they shall take up serpents when Israel goes forth into the tribulation, and as we saw from the covenants of uh, God in Leviticus 26, the, the, the life will be able to come forth, you know, serpents or otherwise, and will be able to go forth and do what needs to be done concerning uh, causing you know, havoc to unbelievers. 
during the tribulation. That's not now. That's not going to be now. When you go through something you go through now, that's just life at large. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 22. We're living in the sin-cursed world. We're not living during the time of the great tribulation at all. Otherwise, we'd, it'd be like this every day. You would be covered in earthquakes and snakes and uh, disease and everything else. Non-stop, 24-7, you couldn't escape it, as we read from that verse in Amos. You couldn't escape it. You can escape it right now. You can not only escape it, you can go on vacation if you want to right now. So it's very much not the day of the Lord today. And so we see that there. But then as we go into the next part of that verse, Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 18, it says, And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and, and uh, they shall recover. So as we go into this, we're seeing another part there. Saying that they shall lay hands on the sick. And so uh, it goes through there uh, talking about this. But before that, it says, and, they, and if they drink any deadly thing, now why would it say that? Why would it talk about, you know, during the tribulation, if we're talking about the little flock of Israel, you know, dealing with snakes or dealing with serpents, being able to stomp on them and go through and receive the manna and talk about the things we read about in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why would they have to, or why would it say if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them? Well, that has to do more so with what we're looking at uh, in the issue of, look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 11. In order to know what's going to happen one day, we need to see you know, what it is. Revelation chapter 8, verse 11. And uh, actually we'll go again back one verse into Revelation 8, 10, going into 11. It says, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So you're seeing during the tribulation, you can't even drink the water. It's so poisonous. It's so horrific. It's so bad. It's so bitter. Uh, because there's going to be something, whether it be an asteroid, whether it be whatever this is, uh, a great star from heaven, something's going to come out of the heavens and destroy a third part of the water on the earth. You won't be able to drink bottled water, whatever it is, it's going to destroy most of the water here. And you won't be able to drink anything. It's going to be that horrific or that poisonous. There's a reminder of this from the book of Exodus. If we go to Exodus, we'll see where this came up once before, this concept at least. We'll get a spiritual lesson from Exodus chapter 7, verse 17. There were plagues during this time. Moses was the man on the scene, God's man on the scene. Exodus chapter 7, verse 17. And Exodus 7, verse 17 says, as we read here, Let's say the Lord, and this Thou shalt now that I am the Lord, behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of that river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, uh, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood and that there may be a blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt." So we see that take place there, the, the concept. Now, will the rivers turn to blood in the tribulation? I don't see that it says here in uh, Revelation 8, 11, it turns to blood. But it does say that the waters will turn so bitter that you can't, you can't drink it. Bringing us back to Mark chapter 16, we see that while the, the serpents come out, Israel doesn't, have, the little flock of Israel doesn't have to bother with them. And they'll be fed manna from heaven. We see that in uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, every day they can pray for uh, uh, daily bread and receive it. 
while the world's starving. We see there also in uh, verse 16, uh, or uh, Mark 16, verse uh, 18, that they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. So they're going to go ahead and be able to go to that stream or that pond that would be otherwise contaminated or bitter or filthy or just unable to be drunk. But they'll be able to go ahead and drink as they need to, being protected by God, as part of these signs that follow those that believe. So we see that there in um, Mark chapter 16, verse 17. These are signs that are following the believers through the tribulational period, making them uh, able to go through what they need to go through. And they can go through these things with ease. So that's something that they're able to do, and they can do this uh, with great comfort. Now, the other thing is uh, another video to look at is uh, we're going to look at this for about, uh, I'd say, close to six minutes. And what this is is a Christian gets invited to an Islamic convention. And as the Christian, uh, he does not know how to rightly divide. What he does is when he's there, he gets invited to an Islamic convention. What happens to him is they call him out on Mark chapter 16. And they say, if you're truly believing in the words of God, I got something for you to drink. And so we'll take a look at that. And you can already figure out what that's going to be. And so he and he doesn't rightly divide. So he's got to figure out what he's got to say. So let me go to that video. And we'll set that. Let me type this in here. And that is going to be. There it is. Uh, this is the Christian who is challenged, and you can pretty much see where this is going. Probably a commercial. There it is. This is a Islamic channel, and pretty much what they're doing is they're laughing at the fact that the guy doesn't do what he's challenged to do. They're going to give him this verse, Mark 16, 17, and 18, and challenge him, of course, with, with if you can see where this is going. According to the uh, title, is a Bible true word of God, and uh, he accept that he uh, he he believed that the Bible is a true word of God, and he believed in Jesus. So I want to ask if you have the complete faith in Jesus Christ, and if yes, then according to I have one uh, question here. According to Mark in the Bible, chapter 16. And verse 18, you have in your lecture said that uh, they will, uh, about the sickness and uh, things that uh, you can uh, recover the sickness of the people. And in the same verse, it stands that if, you, if they drink any deadly things, it will not hurt them. That is the same verse. And I have here a pipe poison. And you please... And you please testify for the audience that you have the true faith in Jesus. Thank you, sir, for your question. My brother has given me a deadly poison and he wants me to drink it. <laughs> he wants me to make a show and tell you that it is true what is written in Mark 16, that if we drink something that is poisoned, we will not die. Now, very strange. You see, I believe in God. I have experienced the Holy Spirit, and in our family, we have experienced the Holy Spirit as a reality. And the Holy Spirit tells us what is going to happen. And my wife told me Thursday night, Stanley, be careful, someone will try to poison you. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I was invited through, uh, when I was invited through Suhil Aziz Khan, that uh, Mr. Ahmed Dita Tuesday evening wanted to give me dinner. My wife said, Stanley, be careful. <laughs> Do you know 
why? Because we know about many, Mus many Muslims who became Christians and were killed. Now, am I going to drink this? And you will see me fall down and die? Now, listen to this. When you know the Bible, the first thing I will answer before, before really telling you what I'm going to do. I, I'm shaking a little bit. Excuse me. But listen now. You see, you asked me if I believe in Jesus. And I want to tell you, I believe in Jesus as it is written in the Gospels. I don't believe in Jesus as it is written in the Quran. Because the Quran denies that Jesus is the Son of God. The Quran denies that Jesus was crucified. The Quran does not accept that Jesus was resurrected. The Quran denies that Jesus is Messiah. And I believe in the, in the way the Bible says that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And He's equal with God. But now listen, my brother. Listen, my brother. Do you know? One day Satan himself approached Jesus. And the devil met Jesus in the wilderness and said, Throw yourself up from a high wall and make a show and try to show the people that you are the Son of God. When Jesus was standing in front of King Herod, even King Herod said to Jesus, now do some miracles for us so we can have a little fun. Mr. Didat, you have written a book and you have made fun of Jesus and you have said that the Bible is contradicting each other, it, 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 itself because in, in, in the prophecies it says, yes, I'm coming to say. If you want to kill me, I must have five minutes more. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that in front of Hero, Jesus did not open his mouth according to the scripture. And Jesus did not make a show of the miracles. And when you gave me this question today, I recognize the devil in you, and I'm not going to obey the devil. I'm not going to make a show. So you see where this is going. Let me close yep. this. Let me open this mm -hmm. back up. <laughs> Guys, slick. Yep. So that's pretty much where this went. Was that uh, you know he didn't know. Paul, and he didn't know how to rightly divide the word of truth, but yet there was still enough information in Matthew where he could go to and say, well, I'm going to go to Matthew 4, and I'm going to still go to the red letters, and that's going to save me from drinking this poison. Uh, the Muslims use that to promote the fact that the guy never drank the poison, therefore he doesn't believe Mark 16, and that's where this all runs from. This is where this all goes with. So uh, we see that there in uh, Mark 16. Nonetheless, they will be able to go ahead and drink any deadly thing concerning the waters that the wormwood will turn bitter. And the little flock of Israel will be able to go forth and do what they need to do while they work off snakes, which we saw that those people get bit by over there in you know, this area of the United States. So these are you know, interesting videos showing that people that don't rightly divide are going all sorts of different directions and that people who still don't rightly divide, this, this book can kill them. As far as if they don't rightly divide the word of truth, they can go in all sorts of strange and interesting directions. So it's not the book, I should rephrase that. It's not the book that'll kill them. It's their own misunderstanding of the book that'll kill them. Mm -hmm. So it's right to rightly divide the word of truth. We see that there. Just want to make sure we're saying things accurately and correctly. Uh, but we see that there and that uh, they shall take up serpents. They shall drink any dead thing and shall not hurt them. That's them, not us. We don't want to touch snakes. We don't go anywhere near poison. We have nothing to do with it. And it says uh, in verse 18, if they shall lay uh, hands on the sick, they shall recover. And of course, there's people that have healing ministries everywhere. Uh, why not go into the ICU ward of a hospital and clean that place up? Of course, they'll never do that. COVID-19's everywhere, and people aren't walking away from that. 
So uh, we see that there concerning laying hands on the sick. You can correlate that with Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 5. We see what Paul has to say about it in 2 Timothy 4.20, 1 Timothy 5 with uh, Timothy needing wine for his stomach's sake. And more importantly, if we look at, uh, it's going to be uh, 2 Corinthians 12. We go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, get some Pauline verses going here. We've been looking at snakes all day and uh, poison all day. That's not the average Bible study here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. When it comes to trials, tribulations, issues, healings, we're not going to go to Luke, I'm sorry, uh, Mark 16 for our doctrine and information. As we rightly divide Mark 16, we're going to go to where we want to see Pauline information in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where Paul prayed uh, thrice that something might depart from him, an issue. We see there it says, uh, and he said unto me, that's the Lord talking to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. When I am weak, then am I strong. And uh, we see that there from what the Apostle Paul talks about concerning trials, tribulations, infirmities, that he can glory in them knowing that when he's weak, it's the power of Christ that can be shown in all that he does. And so we see that there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He goes on from there talking about God's grace being sufficient. And you even see it in Romans chapter 5, verse 4, <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, and uh, 2 Corinthians 4 again. It comes up that way. But as we uh, go to Mark chapter 16, then we'll look at those last two verses and kind of wrap up on it. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. As we see all this doctrinal information, quite a bit of it, for the little flock of Israel as they go through the tribulation and prophecy under the law, especially that New Testament law written in their hearts, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. That's where that's going to plug in for them. We're neither uh, occupants of the Old Testament, nor are we occupants of the New Testament. We're part of the mystery, the dispensation of grace. Ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ preached according to that. We see there in Mark chapter 16, verse 19, says, so, the, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. <clears throat> you see that there. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. That's what it was supposed to do. So after Christ and his kingdom were again uh, rejected, God interrupted the prophetic program and sent forth Paul uh, to proclaim the preaching of the cross and the gospel of the grace of God. That's what happened after this in Acts chapter 9. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, Paul proclaims, as we read this in the end of our outline here, the love of Christ who died for all instructs us to our greater commission, our great commission. And if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, and here's where we're going to wrap up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. We see this here, <clears throat> excuse me. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that uh, if one died for all, then we're all dead. Uh, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. There's our greater commission right there, the ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile people to Jesus Christ. To wit, in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath given and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Again, reconciliation. There's our great, greater commission for today. Now then, as a result, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So there is our great commission. In the dispensation of grace today, that's where we go for our instructions today. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen through twenty-one. If we want to know what is our great commission today, 
uh, we rightly divide Mark 16 from Paul's epistles, more so 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we understand our commission from the Lord uh, to the ambassadors, which is us, saved people. We find that more so in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. We also find it in Ephesians chapter 3. So with that, I know it's quite a bit of interesting information today. Maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't. But I'll leave that open for thoughts or comments, questions, or anything else uh, from this point. I do have a question. I want you to put something in its proper context because Paul himself was bitten by a snake yeah. in Acts 28.3. And they thought the barbarians saw the snake or venomous beast hang on his hand and thought to himself, this guy must be a murderer. A what? A murderer. A murderer? Oh, yeah, okay. So what? 28. Yeah, X28. Yeah. It says, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Albeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they, they they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Yeah. I know this isn't the same what you're talking about, Yeah, yeah. but this is an event that happened to Paul. What is the, what is the, how do you, how do you interpret this? Well, this one is gonna be, uh, I would say the, the short, quick version would be the transitional period where there were spiritual signs fading, but spiritual signs there. Uh, spiritual, um, signs, wonders, healings, those things were there. This would have been so much, not so much a sign of snake uh, handling as much as healing. Uh, that was still going on and fading out at the same time. So they were, they were there, but they were fading out. So, I mean, also, yeah, I have read in the past that just because a venomous snake bites you it does not mean it injects you with venom it's not an automatic thing so now how true that is or not i don't know but i know i read it in the past and it's always stuck with me well don't test thy hypothesis <laughs> no i'm not going to tempt it <laughs> i do make sense and that would make sense too so even if the signs and wonders were fully gone by Acts 28, if that were the case, it would be like Gene said, the serpent, the venomous serpent, serpent could have bit him. Just like you saw that lady in uh, the parts of the United States of America, the, the serpent bit her a couple times. But she already, didn't die. But she didn't die. I mean, they probably have some antidote or whatever they got. That's cool. a whole other story for a whole different example. But with yeah. Paul, it could have been, as, as Gene you know, said, you know, as a hypothesis. Oh. You know, but uh, I'd also go with that. There's you know, just like in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, and he's he's, he's healing the sick and everything else uh, as a transitional thing. You know, because when you get to Second Corinthians 12, 9, Paul can't even heal himself. But it's a transitional thing that fades out. I do have one other question, or yeah. your your insight in most. I say most other Bibles these verses we covered today are not even in those Bibles uh, because uh, in the newer versions of the Bibles, I think it's from chapter 16, verse 9 on, those, those verses were omitted because they didn't think that uh, these verses were in the early versions. Let's see, I got, I got our parallel Bible here. Let's see. Mark. So how could, I guess my question is, how could the 16, how could the, uh, oh, yeah, I this is a group uh, at Pentecostals, how could the Pentecostals, are they use the King James Bible or do they use all different kinds of Bibles? I'm sure they use, uh, uh, I've met some Pentecostals that are King James Bible. She just did. Okay. Okay. Which they don't hand out the packets of knife fork spoon. 
Mark 16. Yeah, I see in uh, Mark, is it Mark 16? Yeah, Mark 16. I, I want to say from verse 9 on, it could be later than that, but I don't think verses 15 through 20 are in the newer versions of the Bible. Uh, yeah, yeah, they they only go up to certain. Well, no, I see it here in some of them. They might be a little bit twisted. Yeah, that could be. Actually, it, some of these just skip. It's so strange. They skip Numbers 13, 14, 15, 16. No, there's in the New American Standard Bible has those verses. Those verses. How about the NIV? NIV. Yeah, it even says they'll pick up snakes. Okay. Of course, they're not going to talk about serpents. So they're going to use some other yeah. easy to read language or something. But Biden snakes. Yeah, but yeah, they're in there. Okay. Okay. So. Hmm. Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? Brightly dividing uh, Mark sixteen. Yeah, I wanted to say um, about the, the verse 9 to 20, I think most of the new ones have a footnote that say that it wasn't in the originals or whatever, but looking into it, there was only two manuscripts that had it, which was the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. So only those two didn't have it, and in those two, they have like a blank column where usually they would start the next chapter. So there's there's a space where that stuff could have been. Oh, and that they removed. Were they uh, removed it from the uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus? Yeah, it, it has blank spots. Like th th they said, usually in those they have three columns of text, and yeah. if if the verse ends in like the second column, the third column will start the next chapter. Oh, okay. And in those, it it ends in the second column. The third column is blank. Yeah. So it's. They've suspected that they removed it. Yeah, and that would make sense. That makes, especially coming from the critical text like that, where they would they would be critical towards the perfectly preserved words of God, uh, Vaticanus and Sidiaticus especially. That would make sense where they're looking to further uh, Romanism or Catholicism like that. That would make sense that they would try to erase that or, or cover that up. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Oops, let me see that. So, yeah, excellent. Any other? Uh, any Thanks, other Nicholas. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Uh -huh. Yeah. See, we're kind of weaving in uh, manuscript evidence with a little bit. Now that we've gone through it a little bit, yeah, uh, we're going to talk or blend it in with our conversation, with yeah. uh, our studies, and yeah, and uh, works out pretty well. So. Okay. Let me see. It's uh, yeah. I don't know if there's any other thoughts on anything. We're, we're looking to uh, intention show those videos showing how broadly dividing the word of truth may have people. Uh, people will bring that to your attention. You can bring that to Pentecostals' attention, saying if you really are a Pentecostal who obeys the science and healings and wonders, Mark 16 may be something that uh, you want to bring up to them. Say, do you really do this? Or do you really think this yeah. is something you're going to go off and do? Are you really going to you know do something you know off the wall like that? Just as a side note, we knew somebody who actually uh, went to a Grace Church who actually did that. Mike, remember Mike? What's his name? Mario. Yeah, Mike. Same thing. Yeah, he actually did that, and he he almost died as a result. And I can never understand why he did that, having so at least a, some understanding. Doesn't of, pertain to us. So. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah. So, so yeah, that's that's our uh, we're rightly writing uh, Mark 16 on that, and uh, we can always uh, wrap up here and pick up on uh, Wednesday with another study, and if that's that's all we have for today. But pretty much there's that's where the Pentecostals get it from. That's where a lot of Christian circles get that from. That's where you see this with the snake handling. That's where you see that with the. Uh, uh, with the people who try to test you know, other faiths, other cults, will come along and try to test your faith by reading to you Mark 16 and then taking out, this is just water, 
but they may come up with a you know bottle of poison from somewhere and say, here, if you're really believing in the Bible literally, because that's what that news article said, then drink this bottle of poison, and uh, they'll leave that up to you. Which now you have the armor of uh, right division, where you can use you know, the armor of truth. You know, armor of truth. You go forth and you show them, hey, look, here's the deal, and uh, you don't have to do that as a result. So. So yeah, we can wrap up here, unless there's any other thoughts. And then we'll pick up on uh, Wednesday. All right. So all right, thanks for uh, joining everyone. We'll, uh, we'll- Grace and peace, everybody. Be back here Wednesday. Glad you were here.